Hi guys, so today for this video we're going to be talking about Dr. Thomas Saez, which if you know anything about him, if you've heard of him before, you would probably know that he's a pretty controversial person in the field of psychology and, you know, presented some pretty radical ideas compared to what was the norm of psychoanalysis at the time of him conducting or doing at the time of his, at the time of him coming to his theory. So a little bit about his personal background before we get into the theory. So one thing to note about Zaz is that he was from Hungary. So I feel like there could be some inkling of, I think personally, I feel like his, um, immigration to the U.S. when he was 18 in 1938 to attend school. I feel like that could have some effect on his theory and the reasons behind him being so opposed to like the idea of coercion. He is of immigrant experience. So I mentioned that he moved to the U.S. or immigrated in 1938 and he did that so that he could pursue a bachelor's degree in physics from the University of Cincinnati and then he later got his MD from that same school. So now that there's a little bit of background we can move on to a little bit about his theory and one of his main foundations was that mental illness should not be termed the way that it is and he had a big issue with the language of mental illness. And he really thought that most of what mental illness consists of is just problems with living and daily life and things that people struggle with on a day-to-day -day basis and giving it a label and like basically basically pathologizing something that shouldn't be. Um, and he did think that some mental illness could be considered that, but it should be labeled as a brain disorder if there is a true basis for it neurochemically or like there is proof that the brain is different and the brain is altered and that is what's causing the illness then he would believe that those should be described as brain disorders and not mental illness and then another point that Zaz makes in his theory is he had a really big issue I think I already mentioned this about involuntary um like institutionalization of people with mental illness he had a really big issue with that and what he thought is that psychiatrists particularly would take people into what he called incarceration um, and take people against their will into treatment programs, or that's how they labeled it. Zaz did not think that was treatment at all. Um, and that he only really thought that people should be institutionalized or incarcerated, as he would frame it, against their will without their permission. Um, without them being able to make like a conscious decision about that. He thought it was only under circumstances where people um, are a danger to themselves or others. That's the only circumstance that Zaz thought that um, incarceration or inst institutionalization should be practiced would be when someone is dangerous. A little bit more about Zaz's approach and understanding of Freud's work and his opinion on Freud. Um, one thing that Zaz mentions in his work is that he views Freud's relationship to the client or patient as more of like a transactional interaction where like Freud is providing a service to the patient or client instead of it being some sort of mutually beneficial. But Zaz would view the therapeutic relationship in psychoanalysis as more of you're being provided a service. So in my mind, that would mean it would be more like a medical doctor relationship where you come here to get this problem fixed and there is no beneficial relationship on the other side. Zaz would also think that psychoanalysis like in terms of the and more more about what he thought about the relationship between the client and therapist and psychoanalysis as he viewed it as like the client 
isn't the therapist or Freud directly and what he's mentioning um, would be considered to be like minding the business of their client instead of minding their own business. And that that business would be to earn the client's trust and that um, the job, can you hear those sirens? It's ridiculous. But that the job of the therapist in this context is to make sure that what their client is telling them is confidential and that it's not going to be shared unless absolutely necessary. And that's what he means by them minding their business or minding the client's business is that whatever is said during therapy is held confidential and is private, which, you know, makes me wonder how he would feel about HIPAA. He further emphasizes like the importance of keeping that confidentiality within psychoanalysis and that that is the psychoanalyst's primary goal in their work is to keep that financial, not financial, but to keep the confidentiality of what their patient is saying to the session. So another term or concept that Saz brings up in his writings and in his theory is the term pharmacracy. Um, and this would be, he would describe this as the pol the politicization, the po politicizing, there we go, the politicizing of the medical industry. And he would call that political medicine. And one of the main concepts in here goes back to coercion and using coercion as a medical treatment or as a medical option. And one thing he mentions is he talks about, um, the Nazis doing something similar and relates that to like American medicine, which I think is really interesting and a really bold statement to make. So another thing around pharmacracy and medicalizing that Zaz brings up is trauma and how like the diagnosis of PTSD and that is founded in trauma that that label can be used to coerce or force someone into treatment for that disorder when they just experience trauma. But obviously PTSD is a viable and valid diagnosis, but he's kind of getting at someone who could just experience any trauma and then be labeled as having PTSD without necessarily Right, and then one other thing he's mentioning is that people in this context are being treated like they cannot handle their own grief, which I think is interesting to think about because grief is very different for each individual. And if you start pathologizing someone's grief, like with the current conversation around adding prolonged grief disorder to the DSM is something that I think about when Saz is talking about medicalizing trauma and what is the normal length process for grief and what would label, when does that become pathological? I think it's a really important question that Saz is really talking about here with PTSD, but it can still, this is, I think this part of his theory is what really remains relevant because, you know, and honestly just the conversation about the label of mental illness I feel like that is still very relevant as more and more people get diagnosed with mental illnesses and experience mental illnesses is there a shift in the near future the shift in the near future that we see about changing the way that we define mental illness and think about it did Zaz was Zaz ahead of his time in this foundation and in his theory is something that I think about because as mental illness gets more and more common and more and more researched and there's more and more diagnosis added, when is there a point of saying, it were, will there be a point where pretty much anyone could be given a diagnosis regardless of, you know, how normal or abnormal they think they are based on what's in the DSM, could anyone be diagnosed? I think 
Zaza's point about the label and the language we use surrounding mental illness, I really think that that conversation is still relevant and something that professionals need to think about. So another part of Zaza's theory that I think is important to talk about when discussing him is that he believed that people's behavior was influenced by games. He would label the behavior that people do and engage in as games and that people base these games off of like social rules and our societal rules and the roles that we have to play as individuals. And I think that this is a really like more concrete or understandable aspect of his theory because I personally definitely know that I act in different ways depending on the circumstance and depending on where I am and, and that that would be considered a game that I'm playing and that my behavior changes based on other people as well and the games that they're playing and the roles that they have. Like I'm going to speak to a professor differently from how I speak to my classmate or my boss or my coworker. All of those are different games that I'm playing because all of those are different roles that I take. I act different in a classroom than I would at work and then I would in my room by myself. I act completely different in all of those situations. And I think Zaz really was getting at something here. You know, a lot of people that read his work argue that he makes a lot of generalizations and that he needs to learn how to edit and that the language that he used can be hard to understand and I agree with that. But I think that we can still get information out of his work, you know, if you're able to digest what he's saying. And then another thing that Zaz talked about in his theory was that psychiatrists would label lying as pathological as a symptom of mental illness. Lying would be a symptom of mental illness. He would link that to hysteria, that a symptom of hysteria, which we now know as anxiety, is lying. And I think that is an interesting perspective to have, but um, maybe not one that I agree with because I definitely think sometimes a lie can have a purpose or can even be accidental and you didn't even mean to do it you're you sh that shouldn't be pathological if it's an accident i mean if you are p pathological liars do exist and that's something to consider but any and all lies to be labeled as a symptom of mental illness just doesn't really hold up to me so there are areas of history that i agree um and that i understand and that i think are valid and valuable to think about and then there are some areas like this that fall short to me but now that we've kind of covered the basics of Zaz's theory. I wanted to mention some criticisms of his theory and one criticism that Christina Richards, who wrote in the Journal of Existential Analysis, makes is that that the myth of mental illness, so she's criticizing the, the book that we read in class, the myth, the myth of mental illness, for not addressing the need for social change as a means of amelioration or getting rid of mental illness. And I think this is important be considering Zaz's work in human rights. It's interesting that he doesn't mention social change or the need for it, like the need to decrease stigma, for example, around a plethora of disorders. That, that, that problem still exists now and it's interesting that maybe if older theorists were to, would have been able to sway the public's opinion and maybe get rid of some of these stigmas or help people better understand those with mental illness as, you know, just like everyone else. And that they could have been the driving force behind social change around those with mental illness. I think that would have been really helpful and accelerating the decrease in stigma or even just, you know, making it happen quicker and previous generations would have a different view um, because I think a lot of um, 
people that are older than me do not have the same perspective as I do and that is I think that has a lot to do with the fact that they weren't educated about mental illness like it was not talked about it was very taboo and if someone like Zaz or Rogers or these other theorists at the time like during the 60s and 70s could have came forward and tried to incite social change you know things could be very different um and I think that Christina Richards makes a really good point that if that would have been mentioned in his book you know it was published in 1961 we could be further along in the journey to getting rid of stigma so another criticism that is mentioned about Zaz's book the mental the myth of mental illness and I think this one is pretty you know I think this one holds up well is that the title of the book itself had more impact than the contents of the book um which is a pretty pretty general generalizing statement to make to say that you are, well it's not necessarily saying that you get more out of the title than the contents of the book because i don't agree with that but that the myth of mental illness as a phrase had more impact on like the psychiatric community the psychology community than the contents of the book itself which i think that's a good argument in the sense that it sparked a conversation just the title sparked the conversation and not, not necessarily the context of the book so another critique about Azaz's work that has a little bit more to do with the reader's interpretation is that what people think Zaz says in his writings is not what he's actually saying and then therefore their critiques of his writing are not valid because he didn't actually say that which I think kind of goes back to my point earlier about the language that Zaz uses and sometimes his writing style can be hard to understand and that can lead to someone falsely criticizing him or pulling something out of his work that wasn't there um which would make it appear like he's saying something that he isn't and that would be why people are critiquing him and that is what Anthony Stadlin thinks and he himself has critiqued Zaz but then later realized what he was critiquing Zaz on he ultimately was not saying that and he also argues that the viewpoint of Zaz being a Cartesian dualist is incorrect um which I think is interesting so basically I, what Cartesian dualism is, is having a concept divided into two contrasting ideas. And to me, Saz doesn't do that in his writings. It seems like everything, his theory as a whole, is it composed of two differing or con contrasting ideas. Or at least I'm not interpreting that way. So I think that that argument is valid that he is not a Cartesian dualist. He makes one point. I think it's kind of what he does and what his theory is based on is one thing and not two contrasting ideas. So the critique that people critique Zaz's work based on things that they are interpreting incorrectly, I think is valid and something that is important to consider when reading critiques and when reading his work. So one final critique about Zaz's work that I found is that Zaz's work is a poor model for those in training. Which to me makes sense because if you're coming in trying to become a therapist or a psychiatrist and your foundation is built on the fact that mental illness at its core does not exist or at least not in the way that you probably think it does and that's what you're foundation of your therapeutic teaching and your the way that you would conduct therapies based off of that I would agree that I don't think Zaz would be the best theorist to teach to someone learning how to become a counselor because there's not a lot of like therapeutic techniques counseling te techniques that he mentions in his work it's not something that he doesn't provide like 
a model for how to apply his theory in a therapeutic context. Not that I can recall in any of his work. Um, so yeah, I think that is a valid criticism that someone that is training to become a mental health professional, whether that's a counselor, a psychiatrist, something else, social worker, I don't think that they would want Zaz as their foundation. So there we go. We've gotten through all the material I had about Zaz, Dr. Thomas Zaz. Um, so yeah, so um, I hope whoever's watching this has a good day. Um, and feel free to comment your opinion in the comments. And my references, they're going to pop up on the screen. Um, but they're also going to be listed in the, in the description for you if you want to check those out. So yeah.